Welcome to the Black Creator Series, brought to you by Candlewick Press in collaboration with Red Clay Educators, hosted by Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, bringing dynamic books, authors, illustrators, and artists to your classroom and to the world. Look for episodes of the Black Creator Series on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Here's Candlewick's Kathleen Rourke to introduce this week's guest. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kathleen Rourke from Candlewick Press, and I'm delighted to welcome the truly talented Rhiannon Giddens. Rhiannon's list of accomplishments is long and lustrous. She's a Grammy award-winning musician, singer, songwriter, actor, librettist, MacArthur Fellow, and host of the upcoming six-episode PBS show, My Music with Rhiannon Giddens. I could go on and on, but we've come to learn about her debut picture book. Yes, she's also an author. Build a House, beautifully illustrated by Monica Mackay, is steeped in sorrow and joy, resilience and resolve, turmoil and transcendence. This dramatic debut offers a proud view of history and a vital message for readers of all ages. Honor your heritage, express your truth, and let your voice soar, even or perhaps especially when your heart is heaviest. Now I turn the conversation over to Dr. Sonia Cherry Paul, a New York Times bestselling author, educator, founder of Red Clay Educators, and co-founder of the Institute for Racial Equity and Literacy. Welcome, Rhiannon. Thanks so much for joining us on the Black Creator Series. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So we know that the very concept of identity is complex and that our identities are sh- are and lived experiences shape who we are. As someone who's incredibly multifaceted, I wonder if you might name some of your identities, those that feel particularly important to you that shape who you are. Um, I think that for me, the my my mixed identity is really important. Um, being of mixed race and culture, um, while also being of a southern culture that is shared by a lot of people. Um, and there's there's so it's kind of like having to f- figure out what that identity is has been a really long <laughs> process, and I'm still working on it, but um mm-hmm. It, it it is the ability to kind of go from one side to the other that I think has gotten me where I am, and that that comes straight out of literally shuttling from the white side to the black side, you know, in my childhood. So I'm a, a mixed person, a southern person, a North Carolinian, um, mm-hmm. a creator, you know, uh, of any kind, really, um, whether it's through music or food or crochet um or words i i just realized that my whole life is really i just have to make stuff <laughs> and as long as i can make stuff i'm i'm sane so <laughs> and part of your identity as you started to mention is musician singer and songwriter you are a grammy award winner um who are the carolina chocolate drops how would you describe the body of music that you create the Carolina Chocolate Drops um, is a band that I co-founded uh, in 2000, whatever, 2006, 2005, um, with two other um, musicians, Dom Flemons and Justin Robinson. And it was all based around this guy right here. You can see him. Joe Thompson is there with his fiddle. Um, and he was uh, 86 when I met him and, and uh deep deeply important person in in the string band community in the old time community and one of the last living links to the black string band tradition Mm -hmm. um as it had been practiced for you know centuries in the united states um and so we we were just very lucky we were all young kind of hungry musicians who got the opportunity to sit at this guy's feet joe thompson and learn his music and kind of get passed down his family's tunes because it had been passed down in his family and he was the last one. And so that kind of opened up a lot of doors for me as a, just as a a creator in general, because uh, it, it was an important conversation to, to have begun the Carolina chocolate drops really, I think inspired a lot of young, like young black players today in old time music and country music. And also I think uh, opened a lot of people's eyes to the multifaceted nature of American culture and how it's told to us versus how it actually 
is. Um, so it's a it's a really important foundation for the rest of my career. I I wouldn't be where I am without Joe and the Chocolate Drops. Mm. You are part of a short and select list of individuals who are MacArthur Fellows, also known as the Genius Grant. Um, And on the MacArthur Fellows website, I watched a video where you describe yourself as a music historian. Um, So listening to you talk about that history just now is making me think about that. And you also describe yourself as as an activist. Could you talk more about that intersection of music and history and activism? Is there a particular moment or circumstance that solidified the importance of this intersection for you as a creator? Yeah, definitely. Um, as I started uh, getting into fiddle and banjo music, because I was an opera, you know, I was an opera student and a graduate of a conservatory and trying to figure out, did I want to go into opera? I was kind of like, I don't know if I have anything to say in the world of opera that hasn't been said a million times before. And I discovered, I stumbled over the old time banjo, which is very different to the bluegrass banjo, right? It's it's a much more funky kind of rhythmical dance thing. And I didn't know anything about the history at that moment. I just knew I loved the sound. And then I discovered that the banjo is an African-American instrument. And I was like, what? It was this huge, like, you know, the discovery was one thing, but then right on the heels of that discovery is the question that has kind of spurred me on ever since, which is, why didn't I know that? Right. And then the question that follows rapidly on the heels of that is, is in whose best interest is it that I don't know that? You know what I mean? So it's like the facts of the matter are really interesting to me, but then I I realized pretty quickly that they're wrapped in, in, all of the things that are wrong, (laughs) you know, with our country, like, you know, white supremacy and, you know, uh, runaway capitalism and all all of these sort of patriarchal considerations, all of these things are wrapped into these false narratives that we've been sold as Americans. And I see the, the the, the destructive nature of those narratives today. So, I feel like, you know, we're all given our our tasks in life. We're all given tools and talents in order to try to make the world a better place. And I feel like my my tool is the banjo. My talent is the ability to take a bit of history and then make a piece of art out of it so that the people who aren't maybe as obsessed about this as I am, who aren't going to read those books, um, might kind of just get a piece of that. And then maybe they are spurred to to go and do further research for themselves. But um, I feel very blessed that I've been led to that work and I live in a golden age of amazing, um, amazing authorship and, and research and, uh, academia. So I have a lot to pull from. Yeah. And so important that, um, we disrupt that cycle of not knowing because there's so much, right. That we don't know. And that question you asked is so powerful you know, who and what does that not knowing serve, right? So I'm thinking of a powerful course of study for young people in schools could be around um, this intersection of music and history and activism, particularly the study of Black um, history, where young people can study the way um, enslaved Africans engaged music to consider and to consider the various purposes for that, right? To preserve their cultural heritage and history, to send messages of protection and hope, um, and as a radical demonstration of Black joy throughout the most dire and inhumane um, circumstances. This um, is, yeah, this is it, you know. At, at the, I've always felt that by not talking about these things, we're actually missing huge pieces of incredible creation that we were a part of. And, you know, again, in whose best interest is that for us to think that this whole time period is a certain way when actually it is proven to be, you know, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. And one of the ways that you are helping to uh, young people navigate those pieces that are missing is build a house. So I'm just going to turn on my document camera so everyone can see your beautiful um, new book. And 
maybe you could talk a little bit while I share some of the pages about how did you come to write Build a House? And was it a song first? So it was a song first and it was during a really, I don't know, I was really frustrated when I wrote this song. Mm. Um, it was during the lockdown and I was locked down in Ireland. Uh, it, was, it was during a lot of the unrest after um, George Floyd. Mm. And I, I was feeling very impotent here in Ireland um, during all of this time. And I was just thinking, this is like my whole career has been this work, you know, um, and I just was getting really frustrated. And I, and I just sat down and I was like, what do y'all want? Like, what do y'all want? You brought us over here. You know, we built the Dagom country and now, you know, this, this, this is kind of how my thoughts were going. And yeah. so that first line, you know, you brought me here to build a house mm -hmm. kind of just came out. And I, I kind of wrote the whole thing in a day, um, just really thinking about, you know, what do you do when you are swept up in events that are beyond your control mm -hmm. and you try to make a life wherever you are in every moment, you know, and, um, I, I, I recorded it remotely with Yo-Yo Ma because he asked me if I had anything for Juneteenth. So I said, I had just written this song and do you want to do it? And and he said, yes. So we did it and it got, you know, you know, he's Yo-Yo. He's amazing. Um, yes. And and people kind of responded to it. And and somebody said in the on Twitter, like, this should be a kid's book. And I was like, huh that's a really good idea, you know? So mm -hmm. fast forward to now, um, and, and, and it is, and I have to say that this is an art form that I've always wanted to do is kids books. I've, I ha I'm heavily who I am today because of the children's books that were gifted to me. One in particular, the Virginia Hamilton, the people could fly yes. those, um, African-American folk tales retold by her. And then also, equally importantly, illustrated by the Dillons who were, I mean, just in my heart. I, I mean, I will buy a book if it has their illustrations in it. I don't even care what it is, you know, cause they're just, they were just amazing. And um, just that knowing how deep that was in my bones, like I've always wanted to be, you know, a part of that legacy. And so this opportunity was great. And, and getting matched with Monica, I picked her out of a group of, artists that were presented to me. And I, and for me, it was such an incredible experience to see how she interpreted these words, because it was really a, a fully act of art creation for, I mean, we didn't talk at all, you know, um, or hard. I don't think I sent anything. I just, you know, it was just the word I was like, the, it's all there in the song. And she, she made this incredible family and this little girl and the plant and the donkey and it's just like the banjo and the fiddle i i was blown completely blown away yeah. um so you know it is really a, a a a come together of two completely disparate art forms and when they come together you know in a way where you know the 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 communication or or whatever she he heard in those words is exactly what i meant i mean that's magic it's yeah. really magic. And listening to you talk about, you know, the racial pandemic of 2020 and the murder of Mr. George Floyd and how that activated you to write this story makes me consider the book, you know, again and see it in, in new ways. I just happened to flip to uh, this page Um so I found a place to build my house, to build my house, to build my house. But you said I couldn't build a house, so you burned it. And when, as we've been talking about what we don't know, what we haven't learned, um, I can't help but think about all of the numerous towns, all of the cities, mm -hmm. um, the neighborhoods built by Black people across history that were burned down. Yeah. Wilmington, North Carolina, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rosewood, Florida. Um, you know, when did you, I'm just wondering, learn about these incidents and massacres? Um, and why should young people learn about them? I mean, you provide a way, a pathway for kids to start to think about 
what happens when Black people um, work to build? Um, and how can we look across history to learn about that? Um, why do you think young people should learn about this? I think it's really important because there's this idea, there's a false idea that in America, all you have to do is work hard enough and you can succeed and you can have the American dream, whatever that is, you know, the house, the car, the 2.5 kids, the spouse, mm -hmm. and that everybody's on a, a, a level playing ground, you know, and these are fallacies. And so what happens is that if you think that and you don't succeed, like you think you should mm -hmm. not recognizing the fact that you're starting here while somebody else is starting here, you know, not, not knowing that means that you take on that, you, you take it into yourself like this is a personal fault. Yes. You know, I, I, I didn't work hard enough. I didn't pay enough attention in class. I didn't, you know, and I think that it's really important to realize that we're all coming to this life with a certain amount of privilege. Some of us have a tiny bit. Some of us have a lot. And then there's everything in between. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to recognize, you know, that it's hard for black neighborhoods to be quote unquote successful when they keep getting either destroyed, shot up, burned, or highways getting driven through the lifeblood of, you know, of districts that keep everything going, or, you know, uh, people being siphoned away, or there's, you know, chemical plants, oddly enough, like all around, you know? So it's just kind of like, I think it's really important to know how constant and how common and how often this happened because then people understand oh this isn't a fluke this is how america was built yes right yes. and so it gets it away from the personal i think mm -hmm. the mistakes we make in racism i i feel is that we focus too much on the personal mm -hmm. you know you called me this mm -hmm. um i didn't get to do that because xyz and we start and we we don't look enough at the systemic yes. you know what are these things that are actually dogging us down, you know, that pe we're not talking about? I'm like, I'm tired of hearing about some of this stuff. It's like, yes, all of it. We need to fix all of it. But we yeah. need to spend more attention on the fact that we don't learn about any of this in school. Right. I was born and raised in North Carolina. I'm 45 years old. I was born and raised in North Carolina, all of my schooling there up until college. And I did not know about Wilmington, mm -hmm. 1898. The mm -hmm. only literal coup on American soil, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like, that's a problem. So we yeah. really need educators to teach this history, mm -hmm. right? So that young people can learn not only about racism and white supremacy, right? But also about the incredible resilience of black people, black mm -hmm. people's innovativeness, ingenuity, how these way makers made a way again and again, um, without resources that others take for granted because they were denied this and how their accomplishments were often met with rage and destruction. And I keep reading your book and thinking about how this story can be read with our youngest, youngest children to, to introduce them to systemic racism, to oppression, to white supremacy, to enjoy the music, to enjoy the story, but to also start to see the world as it is. And educators can have incredibly sophisticated conversations with older children using this yeah. book. And I want to share another page that and talk to you a little bit about what I was thinking when I when I read this. But then you came and took my song and claimed it for your own. So I read this and thought about the importance of having conversations with young people about cultural appropriation and, and exploitation, um, right? It reminded me of your discussion about the banjo and how the banjo was an emblem of African-Americans in the South and then became the emblem of the white mountaineer, mm -hmm. such that you said the banjo is not readily known or associated with African-Americans at all. So was this part of your intention um, as a writer of Build a House to address erasure? I mean, absolutely. And she, I mean, she went there. I mean, it's breathtaking because like if you, if you shift it over, you can see there's the white square dance. 
yeah, <laughs> up in yeah. the corner. And I was like, this is the two pages that's going to give me the most trouble with this book. And I know that, and I'm ready for it because huh? where this is telling one part of the story, like when you look at the history of American music, there is a great tradition of cross-cultural exchange, right? Between poor blacks and poor whites. Mm -hmm. There really is. However, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you look at the history of that, that goes, that's shot through the history of American music. But when you look at what we know about American music and who benefited monetarily and who got written up in the history books and who got recorded, this is the narrative. Yes. This is absolutely the narrative. And it's and it's not to say that those people having that square dance are evil people. What it is talking about is what does it mean to that family? What does it mean to that family? And this is the focus of this. It's like, you can come at me with all this, you know, all this and that. And it's like, I know all that stuff, mm -hmm. but we need to focus on this loss because this is what we have not really come to terms with. I feel like as black culture with this particular moment of the banjo and the fiddle, Yes. You know, within Black culture, they were both extraordinarily important. We were very innovative with them. There were ways that people could earn a living. We were extremely important just in the creation of the American, you know, commercial industry, all of this stuff, right? What does it mean? And, and how do you, how does that, how does that start a pattern that then is, you can, you can see it through yes. the, the, the following decades of how that pattern is repeated and repeated and repeated. And so with this book, the focus is on the family. It's mm -hmm. not, we're not talking about, you know, uh, uh, Basco Lamar Lunsford or, 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 or Elvis Presley, whatever. We're not talking about them. We're talking about this family. Yes. You know but that? we could talk about that. We could talk about the banjo and, and everything that you shared. We could talk about the blues. We could talk about jazz. We could talk yep. about Elvis and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And we should. Yeah. Because, you know, some educators and some parents and caregivers believe that, you know, children are too young to learn about these kinds of issues related to race and racism. And often these assertions, we know what they are. This is an attempt to shield white children. As yep. we know that black and brown children engage in this conversation from a very young age, as they experience inequities, mm -hmm. right? From, from their, their early, early childhood, all children, all children absolutely can learn about racism. And your book is an example of the kind of meaningful conversations that adults can have with, with children. I'm so glad that we are shouting out the illustrator because I mean, Monica Mackay, am I pronouncing her last name correctly? Did, so. did the thing, did the thing here. Did did all the things. The thing, all the things, <laughs> all the things, yes. I learned your words, wrote my song, wrote my song. I learned your words and wrote my song. I put my story down. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of story? And as a musician and an author, the various ways our story can be metaphorically speaking, speaking um, put down, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of goes back to the heart of my earliest sort of engagement with creating out of historical uh, documents. So, cause what I first started doing was thinking about, I had, I had learned a lot of narrative ballads from the Anglo Celtic sort of across the sea tradition. And it's a very, very rich tradition. And it came to America and where it, you know, survived in certain, certain places. And I thought, you know, it's a different style to a, a, where a lot of the way the story is told in a lot of different places in Africa um, and the way that, that that kind of storytelling came over, you know, to the United States. And so like in, you know, more solidly African-American songs, the narrative is not near, is not, it's not uh, linear, right? Mm -hmm. It's told in different ways. And then there's also the whole, like, how do we say things that aren't going to get us killed right in these songs so there's a lot of code there's so it's a whole different it's a different tradition there's a different you know life that's surrounding these songs but i started thinking what if we had you know a narrative a linear narrative tradition you know so i started writing songs kind of like thinking in that way and thinking about like how do how do we write our story and 
how do we get diminished when other people write our story for us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what we're doing, I feel like as a culture, and this is a gross generalization, you know, African-American culture is different in Detroit than it is in North Carolina and whatever. But, you know, as, as a general rule, I feel like this is our task ahead of us is that we are rewriting or discovering our actual story instead of the one that has been fed to us and everybody else. It's like there's depth here. And there is that's why this story ends with, you know, I got my bucket. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, you're going to take all the, I'm going to just dig deeper. Right. Because it never, it never ends because mm-hmm. we are so, you know, as all humans are, we don't have a, we don't have the, the, the patent on, <laughs> you know, being, having a soul and, and being human and having a deep connection to whatever it is that people believe, but that is how we've gotten through. And I think that the more that we dig in to these these stories as an, as ideas of how we survived these things and how we thrived and how we continue to reinvent ourselves and spur the culture of a country and therefore the world. Yeah. When you think about where hip hop has gone, when you think about where country music has gone, where you think about where rock and roll has gone, it's freaking <laughs> amazing. Yes. Right? But if we don't know the core of it at the, at the start, at the center, then it's always going to be the, the, the edifice is always going to fall apart because we don't have that centerpiece. Yeah. And yeah. I want to just, again, go back to your book because you also leave us with this really powerful afterward. And you write that this book is more, uh, is about more than enslavement, but essentially it's about Black people's resilience, our humanity, and how, as you end the story, we shall not be moved, right? Um, So it's critical that we preserve our stories and to do so in all of the ways that our gifts allow us to, through writing, through music, oral traditions, dance. It is how we, as Black people, resist being erased from our own narrative. Right. It is how we survive. And I want to point out to educators that um, and caregivers and young readers that they can access this QR code um, to hear this incredible musical performance of Build a House by two phenomenal Grammy Award winning musicians, yourself and cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Throughout Build a House, the pronoun you is used. Mm -hmm. What questions do you imagine children might ask about who is you and how do you recommend that educators and caregivers answer? I, I think that that's a really good question. Um, and I think it, it's tied to how we speak of people during this time, right? Mm -hmm. You can say, slave Mm -hmm. or you can say enslaved Mm -hmm. right and the word those two those additions enslaved means that there was an action being done Mm -hmm. on that person Mm -hmm. therefore there has to be a person who did that action Mm -hmm. and so i i would love it for that to be a part of the conversation is that people don't just end up in these situations Mm -hmm. right they don't just end up you know, in a foreign land, (laughs) you know, um, with a a burning house behind them, people are looking for things, wealth, power, you know, um, and they do things that affect folks like this family. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to talk about that because people like, you know, I mean, people made decisions to go and get people to sell their you know, the village next door to, you know, uh, enslave the, the native inhabitants of the people made these decisions because they wanted something. They wanted stuff that was more important to them than the humanity of the, of the people that they were enslaving. So I just, you know, however people, there's a, a lot of different ways of talking about it. I think you can, you can talk about like, what does it mean to have power? What does it mean to be able to tell people to go do something and they can't talk back to you? Like, what does that mean? Um, and how does it make you feel? 
mm-hmm. you know, to know that you can't do anything because of who this, you know, this person. Anyway, I, I don't know. It's I'm excited. I'm excited at the potential that this could lead to important conversations, you know, which is, I think, what children's literature is, you know, really about is is leading to these mm-hmm. to these um, connections that children are absolutely able yeah. to see, you know, they are, they are when framed, to- you know, like, you know, with particular vocabulary and stuff, obviously you can't talk to a four-year-old like they were 25, but um, they were able to see a lot more. I mean, I have kids and I've read a lot of kids' books to them mm-hmm. and to see the questions that they had. I was like, man, they're really, they're really getting this stuff. Yeah. Um, they're really getting it. They're hearing it. And the thing is like, if they're going to hear it anyway, you might as well be there to help them hear the real stuff and the truth and to be there to help them, you know, go through it. We must also be willing to explicitly name white supremacy and yeah. whiteness, because yeah. if not, children start to believe that all of this oppression is happening because of some invisible force. Yes. We have to be ready and brave enough to say that there have been and continue to be a lot of white people who uphold this idea of white supremacy and and the ideology of whiteness and anybody can uphold whiteness and and and, and uh white supremacy not just white people right, right. Um, we have to be willing to be brave enough to say that we are living in a time where the truth is weaponized when in fact the truth isn't a weapon at all it's freedom and when children have access to the truth They are empowered to see the world as it is and to imagine a different and more just way of of being. Rhiannon, what's now and next for you? Will you be writing more books, recording more albums? What can we all look forward to? Um, well, a little bit of everything. I have more books uh in the pipeline with Candlewick, which I'm so excited about. They were really amazing. They came in um you know, I, ha- I, I didn't know if anybody would be interested in me writing kids books. And they, they came in with just so much interest in the story that I was trying to tell and so much support. And I, I just, I feel like so incredibly blessed and lucky to be with them. And so that's, there's more of those, um, which, which more information, you know, to come <laughs> and I'm working on my next record this year and um, working on a piece about 1898. It's a lot going on. Not always. I kind of, I kind of, you know, overfill the play a little bit, but there's just so many stories that need to be told that I'm just trying to tell as many as I can, or at least help, help them be told. We really, really look forward to all of it. You said that art can challenge and transform and inspire Rhiannon, you accomplished this in multiple ways as a truth seeker, conscious keeper, and storyteller. What does it mean to you to be a Black creator? Um, I think we bring who we are to our creations always. I think it's impossible to create with no lens because that's just how it works. And I think that, you know, being a Black American um, and also having, you know, uh, it's this multiplicity, right? It's when we think about um, identities and they can exist all at the same time. So I can have an identity as a mixed person, but also realize that I have an identity as a Black American and they're not exclusive, you know, mutually exclusive. So um, for me, it's a really unique vantage point because our history is a unique history, even amongst a long millennia long history of people being moved from one place to another, of being enslaved. I mean, we're not the only ones, but, you know, the combination of a lot of factors have, have given us a very um, unique lens. And so I don't fight it. You know, I, 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 celebrate it and I allow it to tell me where I need to go next um, and which story to tell next. Because if it's one thing we know how to do is it's how to tell stories and it's how to 
you know, figure out what that next, that next thing is. <laughs> we good at that. So <laughs> yes. thank you, Rhiannon. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Black Creators Series, a Candlewick Press and Red Clay Educators collaboration. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notifications button so you won't miss an episode. For more information about the Black Creators Series, go to blackcreatorsseries.candlewick.com or soniacherrypaul.com or go to redclayed on Twitter and Instagram.